Good morning, every, everyone. Welcome this morning. You made it just on time. I'll invite you to join me in standing, and we're going to sing uh, This Little Light of Mine this morning for opening. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we're thankful to be able to gather in your house this morning. We're thankful for the word that you've given us that we can use to shine and show your love to other people through the way we live and through our lives. And we ask that you'll, you'll be with us as we, as we study your word this morning. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated, except for you guys that are going to give me a verse. Good. Second and third grade. youth group. adult class. Good. I'll invite the other classes to join you in standing and we'll do the first verse of this little light of mine as they're dismissed. I need to ask, is there anybody that needs the list of questions? Pastor Norton has got them. I forgot to grab them. I intended on grabbing them, but I didn't do it. And you probably have verse cards too, right? <laughs> okay. Good morning. Have you been to the graveside of your loved ones? Is that coming up? Tomorrow? Mike, you got that? I 
try to keep this really simple. End time events. Short title, right? Let's get, let's just chop it down to end time. What do you think about time? Can't keep it. <laughs> I, I looked at this. This is a chart uh, from, I've taken from Philip Larkin's dispensational charts. I worked, the, the job I did, I built machines and then before that was in management and, and different things. We looked at time, tack time. How long does it take for that machine cycle to go through? And when they would bring out a new machine, they'd bring out the prints and I said, well, where's the time chart? So I looked at this. That's kind of a time chart. But then I really started looking at it. See, there's time stamps all over that. Except there's two problems. What's one problem? Well, we start there with the church age. We know when the church age started. That would be the beginning of, the, of this chart. But it ends at the resurrection, the church age, uh, at, at the rapture. Because the church is taken out, okay? Okay? And that's going to be part of it. You'll, you'll, we'll come to that. We'll, we'll hit on that again. And then you got three and a half years, three and a half years, and with uh, 70 weeks of Daniel, they come up with, depends on what you're, some people believe that three and a half years is the tribulation. But, yeah. And then we come to the millennium, a thousand years, another time stamp, right? Okay. But where we get in trouble is that last one, eternity. That's when time will end. And when we're raptured into Christ, that's when time will end. Where's this all going? What am I, do we get lulled with time? in our responsibility to the world around us? Do we lose track? Do we somehow? Well, I'm going to have you turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. This is not on your lesson. This is, I have to sort of apologize. I, out too many questions. I tried to keep them to the, about 10. They were very good questions. Second Peter chapter 3. I was here when the last time we were talking about this thing of the eternal state, Revelation chapter 21, 22. And I, I went through part of this section of scripture. I want to put in at verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, end times. Scoffing, following after their own desires. When you look, we, we, some discussion has come up, well, is this the end days? How do you know that? Evil, right? I mean, you see the news, you see all that's going on. All the sick stuff that's happening. But there's other stuff. And that's the one thing I'm going to mention here. This, uh, in the last days, the scoffers come following their sinful desires. The King James said their sinful desires, their sensual desires. They say, where is the promise of his coming? Oh, that's kind of nice. Well, his, maybe he's talking about Christ, you know. There's kind of a association here for ever since the fathers fall asleep fathers maybe their fathers maybe the uh, fathers of Abraham Isaac and Jacob That's kind of a close association there maybe here's where we're going to go with this all things continue 
as they were from the beginning of creation. Oh, he talks about creation. Think of time in the essence of slow and fast. Roger's talking about time goes too fast. Verse 5, for they deliberately overlooked the fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water, through water, by the word of God. I'm going to introduce you to two, two words. What Peter's talking about, and I was trying to remember how many years ago Pastor Branham, maybe it was a Wednesday night, he talked about this. And then I was in my research, I ran on to a video, actually three of them, by John MacArthur, where he talks about this. And it's called Uniformitarianism. Now hold it. Don't go look up in your yellow pages for the local church of the Uniformitarians. It's a philosophy. It's a, it's a theory, okay? Okay. Where did this all start? Like anything, it started with a guy named James Hutton in Scotland. And you think of only golf coming from Scotland? No. He lived from 1726 to 1797. Uh, I got this information from an ungodly source. It's the uh, National Geographic Organization, but it's historically, you know, there. And we're going to talk about that. Well, it's interesting. Another gentleman named Charles Lyell, L-Y-E-L-L, -L, he lived from 1797 to 1875. Well, first of all, James, this first gentleman, he was a Scottish farmer, a naturalist. And he looked at the world around him in the eyes of, well, the geology, He's strictly, we're talking geology at this point. It took a long time. His, his theory is that it took a long time for the things to occur the way they are. Mountains, you know, erosion that made a mountain. He, he wouldn't have had a chance to look at the Grand Canyon. He said, oh, it took billions of years to form the Grand Canyon. Uh, these gentlemen did not know each other, Charles Lyell. Because the, the year that James died, Charles was born, 1797 to 1895, 75, excuse me. Charles was a uh, geologist, and evidently James left documents, a book or something, and he started reading all this, and he said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. So he wrote a book. Principles of Geology, okay? He wrote that in 1830. And in this article by the National Geographic, they said, well, in 1830, this theory changed the previous theory, which I got to tell you, I subscribe to, and you all should hear, catastrophism. Fast. This replaced catastrophism, according to National Geographic. Well, like I say, he died in 1875, left this book. A gentleman named Charles Darwin, he picked this up. And uh, he applied this slow history principle. All these people are walking away from God's word. And he applied this to evolutionary biology. Hence, evolution. And so his explanation was that it took billions of years to create all of this. Man. Let's go back to something really important in God's word. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and through water by the word of God. That by means of these, the world then existed and was deluged with water and punished. Verse 7. 
but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Verse 8. We're going to talk about time, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, with but the, the Lord, that the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not, I keep wanting to say slack from the old King James, slow. See? <laughs> this word again, slow to fulfill his promises as some men count slowness, but is patient toward you, and not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, fast. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, fast. And the heavenly bodies that will be burned up and dissolved fast in the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed fast. Verse 11, since all, this is where our application comes in, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness waiting for the hastening, the fast, coming of the day of, the, of God, because in which the heavens be set on fire and dissolve fast, and the heavenly bodies will melt fast, burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Uniformitarianism? No. Catastrophism. This will come up. Again, um, I go to Revelation chapter four. That's where we're going to put in. On this question, I sort of reached out to you for help a little bit. I mean, um, I'm going to read Revelation four one here. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. What we're looking at is that phrase, come up. Last week, Larry was in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I was sitting there sweating. <laughs> um, so he's talking about rapture. Verse 6, 1 Thessalonians, you don't need to turn there. I, I can. For the Lord himself will descend from, from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together. That's what key phrase there. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Eternity. Verse 18. Oh. Incur therefore, encourage one another with these words. So, you know, we've, we've been through this study of how to look at things in the Scripture, and use these tools, comparison, as a compare the two passages in light of the subject of rapture. I hope that question was clear. Because what happened? I go through the, the lesson, and uh, right there where it says resurrection of the church and the rapture, they're saying the rapture is here at where it says, come up here, speaking to John. I ain't buying that. <laughs> Phyllis ain't buying it. I'm in good company. Oh, I do that. And, and I think, you know, 
we look at trying to make things fit, trying to find a place for this in this, in this part of Revelation, true, it's going to be in the church age, and that's where John was. So I, this is open to discussion at this point. Phillips. You're saying chronologically, this just doesn't. Along with that, John lived on beyond the Isle of Patmos. He died somewhere else, according to history. So he, this was not, he came back. The rapture, we're not coming back, except for Revelation 19, when we come back to, for the Christ. And, uh, I'm sorry, what? Good one, yeah. And you'll see that throughout the scriptures of the Revelation. Good, good. Anybody from uh, the the use of the word? Harpazo. Raptus. Raptus is the is the Latin which we get rapture from. Okay. Um, and it was taken from the Latin Vulgate. Interesting, when you go to come up, it's a verb, it's not harpazo. Okay? I got the transliteration. Martha said I ought to ask Phyllis to help me with this. I can. <laughs> I'm not a Greek. But trust me, it's not, it's not harpazo. And it's interesting, this word comes up again later, and I'm going to bring it out, where there's a similar situation come up here. I don't want to get into that because I'm going to keep going there. Any, anything else? Yes. 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 And there's no mention of the church. Key. Actually... What, they, what they're mentioning here in the book of Revelation, after you leave chapter 3, there is no mention of the church. That's a, I think that's really important. Um, yes? Are you going to remember Paul was taken to the third heaven? This is where John saw yep. the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Yep. And I think there's a matter of semantics here. Yeah. So you're saying that he was actually physically translated as well as spiritually? Yeah. You know. I don't think, I don't think John ever died. Well, you think he was like Jesus Elijah? Was one of the three you know, in the gospel. And yeah. one of them is not saying he will not die until the kingdom of God comes. Yeah. And that's in my translation. <clears throat> it's not what's called the kingdom of God. Yep. Anybody else? Excellent. I, I love that you guys are. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. The 24 elders fell down before him who were seated on the throne and worshiped him who lives forever and ever, eternity. They cast their crowns before him, saying, This is in poetry? Yes. Oh. Worthy are you, O Lord God. To receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. And by your will, they exist and are created. The question, I like questions. Questions are a good teaching tool. They found out through all the scripture. When God said, Adam, where art thou? He knew where. So I'm going to ask questions I know the answer to, but why would it be appropriate for the elders to cast their crowns before the Lord's throne? Go 
Go ahead. It's not about us, is it? It's not about what they did. That's a real important thing for us to remember. What talents, what we've been given, opportunities. And this thing crowns when I was, I first heard this in church, you know, I was like, I'm thinking these guys are taking these golden crowns and whipping them out there and they, the gold and they hit the boom, 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 boom. No. See, this is all based on the culture of the day, what a crown was. And that word is Stephanos. And what they'd do, they'd send some gomer out the woods and he'd pick a wreath and he'd make a, Martha makes wreath. <laughs> these wreaths out of grapevines. But they'd do that kind of thing and then you'd wear that. It was a perishable thing. It would rot away. But for the moment, being the winter and wearing it, I'm the man. It's not about us. I always listen to people's personal pronouns when they talk about what, where they're at and what they're doing. Revelation chapter 5, verse 14. I got to watch the clock. Time again. It's too fast. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Question there, number three. How should we respond when we realize how vital the connection is between Christ's death and God's plan of redemption? Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Worshipped. He has worth. He is worthy. He is worthy. Worship. Anybody else? And we see a lot of that, as John has mentioned, how they fell down, how John did twice, mistakenly. Revelation 7, verse 16. Revelation 7, 16. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Verse 17. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The question here in verse, the question four, what will God do with those saved and killed during the tribulation? This is not the church. These are those who are martyred, and we'll see we're going to talk in a minute about tribulation. So what will God do to those? Comfort them? How long, O oh Lord, is the question from under the altar for those who are martyred? Fast. Just like he's taking care of the church, age martyrs, he's going to take care of this thing of Chapters 8 through 18, it really starts in 7. Tribulation. This word for tribulation is um, used 45 times in the New Testament. I don't have the word, is it? But in Revelation 7, 14, the verse is, and these are they that came out of great tribulation. In Matthew 13, one of the other places it's used, uh, the parable of the sower, how that those fell away because of 
tribulation and problems with being identified with the Word of God. They fell away because of tribulation. Tribulation, here and now, should bring us closer. I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the question here. This is, like I say, from chapters 8 through 18. How should imagining unsaved friends and family members going through the trumpet judgments affect our witness to them now? See, not only really the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, all of the tribulation. How should it affect us, our way of witness now? Do you really believe this? I do. If you really believe this, it had all the difference in the world. To lost family. Go ahead, Roger. Not often enough. Yeah. Revelation chapter 11. Let's bring us up to question six. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stood before the Lord of the, of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, Fire poured out from their mouth and consumed the foe, their foes. If anyone harmed them, this is how the, he was doomed to be killed. Verse 6. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire and they have and when they have finished their testimony the beast who will rise from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lay in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where their lord was crucified. Clearly, I would say that's Jerusalem. For three and a half days from the people, the tribes, and the language, and the nations will gaze on their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days of the breath of God, of life, entered them, and they stood up on their feet in great fear on those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. That's that same word. This is, there's no mention of the church here, so this is not rapture. Same word as, as John's come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. My question on this was, how does these two witnesses uh, reveal about the heart of God, God's heart? After I got into this, that question is strictly from the book. I got thinking about this, this whole period of time and what went on. There's more that actually, besides these two witnesses, which sound a lot like Elijah and Moses. Uh, so, Revelation 14, 6. I'm not going to go... This is the three angels, okay? I'm going to... Talk just briefly. I'm going to read the first one. And I, uh, verse 6, 
chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear not, fear God, and give him glory, excuse me, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And the second angel pronounces judgment on the fall of Babylon. And the third angel um, warns about taking the image of the beast and his mark. So, really, there's three, three things going on here. Now, the hundred we have the 144 that are from the tribe. Each is 12,000 from the tribe of Israel. So that's their prophesied. So you have, you have the angel that's going around the earth. You have the, t the testimony of the two witnesses. All of this going on. The question is, what does it reveal about God's heart in evangelism? Yes, exactly. I'm going to repeat that. He's still holding the door of salvation open. He's not willing, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The heart of God, love in spite of time of wrath, Yes. Okay. But they're reminded this is the eternal gospel. That's where the only. We don't see where they have a real. Yeah. Yeah. We do. A lot of uh, the ministry that goes on is with the Jews, bringing them. They have to come the same way we did, through the blood. They have to be saved the same way. Okay. Um, I have no, there's no question on number seven, or no verse uh, application in question seven. What messages does God send with the bowl judgments? It's open to well this says that he God is all powerful and mankind's sin must be met with God's wrath go ahead Charlie Anyone else? Sin must be met with God's wrath. Go ahead. He used the same plague that he used in Egypt. He did. To judge the people there. Yeah. You know, and, and when we look at the tribulation, we see a lot of people... It doesn't 
bring them to repentance. That's the sad thing. You see them turn around and still worship their idols of gold and silver and, and wood. You know, I, I, I used to look at people's, say, well, this bad thing happens to them. Will it, will it bring them to Christ? Will it, will it change their direction? Once in a while it does. A lot of times, no. Just like in the parable of the sower, the tribulation comes to fall away. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's begin in Revelation 19. Putting into verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, cry out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Question eight. What is the long-term significance of the church's marriage relationship with the Lamb? You know, <clears throat> when I think about this, renewal coming back at, uh, at the end of this espousal period. Take John 14, believe in God, verse 1, believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house, I like to talk about the Father's house, are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And how Christ goes away, come back to take us unto himself. Now, the whole context of that is very traditional Jewish. Um, we look at uh, Joseph and Mary, and uh, they started into this espousal period, and he found Mary's pregnant. So what he starts down the path of divorcing her, and of course. The angel visited him, so this is of God. But what he, they, they had a contract going there. Even though they hadn't completed, they were in this engagement process. And they hadn't consummated that. And it, and it meant, you know, hands off physically. That's the context of the Jewish marriage ceremony. You know, if you break an engagement, it was a serious thing. It was, it was required a uh, decree of divorce. So this picture of Christ going away, building, preparing this place for us, is there a, a covenant that we have entered into it when we accept Christ? Amen. The covenant relationship, not full marriage supper of the Lamb yet. That's kind of interesting looking at people that teach, well, you lose your salvation. And that's true. God divorced his people for sin, for immorality. And that's what we do when we walk away from God. We sin against him in just that manner. Long-term significance. The marriage relationship with the Lamb. Any other comments? Question nine. Um, how does your your figure how does your, your figure to view, view a future marriage to the Lamb inform your understanding of your relationship with Christ now? And maybe I started into that already. Don't fool around on Christ now. Be true to him. Go ahead, Roger. I put it down on which, which relationship we're going to, what the bond we're going to have. Yep. The bond we have with the Lamb will become one that we, you know, when we were married, I think we said, I love one of the Lord's commandments, to love God 
Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that's how our relationship should be with Christ. As we grow in him. Yep. Mm-hmm. As we grow in Christ, we should become mature and not babies. Yep. Drinking much, still drinking milk, mm-hmm. but maybe eating meat. Excellent. Question 10. Given the clear sequence of outcomes of future events, to what do you attribute Satan's attempt to overthrow Christ anyway? You know, that's a question. I think as, as puzzled the, theologians, they thought about this. But you got to, Satan is a criminal enterprise. Um, I've read about the organized crime and, you know, they have the goods on these people and they bring them in the court and it's like denial all the way down to the end. They will fight this, and there will be no regret, no conscience. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, I can't help but believe he's read the last chapter like we have. And still, continues on with this. Go ahead. We see the demons when Christ walked face the earth. They come out. And say, this is the Son of God. They recognized that, and they recognized. And James, it said, you know, even the demons believe, but they did not believe under to where they say yes. You know, if they and, and that type of thing. I understand those the angels, the demons were confirmed in their judgment. You know, and, and, and I'm sure Satan knows a lot of Scripture. I mean, it's it's not a matter of head knowledge. It's a matter of submission. Question 11. What effect should ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom have to your life today? And really all of this stuff, I like the way the, the lesson comes back to here and now. What are you going to do with this? I mean, it's interesting. Look at the chart. The millennial kingdom. How does it affect us now? It'll help us? We have hope. We have hope. Enjoy. Enjoy. But the question there is, how does the uh, this ruling and reigning with Christ? Do we have a, a part in this? Maybe it ought to sober us how we look on our decision-making process in regards to people around us. You know, we're held accountable to how we do this. Question, Revelation 20, 
verse 11. And this is a judgment before the great white throne. Revelation 20, 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who seated on it, from the presence of the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the book, in the books. Here's a phrase here, I want you. According to what they have done. And the sea gave up their dead that were in them. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So we have the resurrection of lost of all ages. Resurrection to, and they're, they're judged according to their actions. One of the biggest actions. There's nothing we do to earn salvation. So, but what, but denying Christ that's, a, that's something they've done. Rejected the gospel message. And all of the wrath of God applied upon their sinful lives. The question is there, what strikes you when you read these verses? Those, that's one of the things I know I stir. What strikes you? Go ahead, Chuck. I'm sorry, repeat that. No, yeah. You know, this thing of, I talk to people about Christ, and I said, you know, I'm going to die once. There's no second death for a believer. If you're un, you die in your unbelief, that's one death, then you die again. The second death. Die twice. Something that strikes me is the speed of these events. Now, we're talking a lot of people. Catastrophism at its finest, unfolding. Question 13. For those of you who have, have trusted Christ for salvation, what do you think will be, you will enjoy about eternity. This is when we step from the time stamps to no time. And actually, really, when you're raptured, you're stepped into, because remember what? God's outside of time. We're bound by time. So what's the greatest joy of eternity? Boy, I ought to get up. Jerry? Yeah. You know, we're in a, this memorial weekend, and we think about those that have died for our freedom. Well, the eternity of memorializing the cross, the blood. That'll be a memorial day for eternity. No day. Eternal day. Go ahead, Chuck.
and we can look back and as that songwriter said and he has led us all the way led us step by step each day you know the joy of being with Christ the one that loved us kept us I, I, you're, you're on way, but you know, with uh, eternity cannot come quick enough. Go ahead, Larry. The end of the battle with the flesh. That constant gnawing, temptation, gone. Gone. Thank you, Larry. You know, we're going to close in prayer and I'll pick up my notes. Your gracious Heavenly Father, we come, we step into these few moments around your word, and we just pray that these moments have, have counted for you. We just understand that uh, we have locked ourselves, in, in, we're in time, and we're responsible for what we do in time, we're responsible for what we do. Lord, just uh, may these messages from your word, from uh, those that have prepared and asked you these questions and done so well this morning, apply this to our heart. May tomorrow be different when we go forth. May we think of this Memorial Weekend as memorializing what you have done for us, setting us free from the penalty of sin. Now just be with the next service and just use your word in our hearts. In your precious name, amen. Thank you.